So here's the agenda for this morning. It's now gone 9.40, so we're going to get into the future of construction. We're already 10 minutes behind schedule. I'm going to go through the MRT Line 2 project as a case study, and I'm going to show you the common data environment. The common data environment is the platform by which we share information. But I'm going to share with you the rules that you need to play by in order to be successful on a common data environment. Then we're going to use the breakout rooms discussion. Um, I'm not sure how that's going to go, but we're going to give it a go. Uh, and then we're going to break for coffee and a nature break at about 10.50, maybe 11 o'clock. After the break, we'll get into design coordination management and how you use BIM for improving design coordination. And again, discussing issues around that. Um, and then we're going to get into things about drones, laser scanning, and photogrammetry. Some of you got experience in that already, which is great. We'll do another breakout room discussion around uh, time, cost, and facility management. Um, and then I'll give you some feedback on those. And then we'll wrap up towards the end with some industry needs, challenges, and a Q&A. So for those of you who've joined us since the start, please, please interrupt with a question. You can use the uh, work Zoom group chat with questions. Or if you simply want to interrupt, turn on your mic and feel free to interrupt me. Um, to be honest, this is a very weird way of doing a lecture where I don't hear any hear anything. I don't know if you're all listening. I don't know if you're going to have to walk the dog. I have no idea. So I, any questions or any comments would be useful. So we've done the Google form. Um, one comment on technology. So it doesn't matter which technology you see, there is a Gucci handbag, of, handbag effect or an iPhone effect that you have to be very wary of. A lot of people would like to have a drone or they would like to have a 3D printer or they would like to have someone who can write machine learning code to do something cool. Before you play with the toys, before you use the technology, you need to start with a problem. So then you can figure out which solution, technology solution you need to solve it. So what we do in our, in our organization is we define the problem that we're trying to solve. So for example, the tunnel boring machine, we were trying to improve the productivity and we wanted to know if we could do self-driving tunneling and we're only using it for the drilling operation. So we're not using it for any other operations. We're simply drilling automatically. We wanted to see if we can improve the productivity. And we've done that. We've got a 10 to 12% productivity gain. So we know that the software and the programming and the hardware we invested in has been effective. Um, for modular offsite fabrication, again, it's a productivity issue. We don't have a 3D printing machine in our office because we don't see the value. Um, and we have not started doing 3D printed building because we believe it's got to go a long way. So in terms of BIM, um, there's a definition from 2012, which is now eight years old, uh, that our careers and the prosperity of our firms depends on us, everybody on this call, becoming familiar with the tools, processes, and value propositions of BIM. And there should be a big red line through that, but it should actually be information. So we're now living in an information age, which is not a surprise to anybody, but we've got to figure out how to use it to become a, a valuable tool. So, if you've not already seen it, this, this is a very good report to go and read. This is the World Economic Forum, um, and they've written a number of papers in 2018 and 2019 on the future of construction. And the papers are useful because they actually describe the technologies, some of the applications, but they also touch on the need for training, the need for education, and the need for collaboration. So if we quickly look through a number of these, I'm going to just give you some examples, but the, the top two, number, they're not actually in any in order, but the number one and number two are around prefabrication and advanced building materials. So we talk about IBS, which is industrial building systems in Malaysia. You'll probably be familiar with prefabricated modules where you are. If you're in Singapore, they have a different definition, which I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, and then you get into 3D printing and additive manufacturing. Again, it's probably more prevalent in the metals industry at the moment, some of this additive manufacturing. Autonomous construction is going to grow and grow and grow. So if you get an opportunity to get involved in companies that are developing drones or autonomous excavators or developing technologies for uh, IoT, then this is going to be very, very interesting space going forward. So the reason for this is there is a great demand for productivity and not enough people to do the work. So autonomous construction is becoming is going to become more and more prevalent. Augmented reality and visualization is becoming easier because technology is becoming better. So things like I, the iPads are much better now. You can get the HoloLens 2, which has got much more technology. That's going to grow and grow and grow. And we're going to see two main fields. One's going to be design, design visualization, design optimization. So for the architects, for the engineers in the group, 
you need to be paying a close attention to what's happening with augmented reality and virtual reality. It's going to become an absolute necessity in terms of doing design work. Um, and then if you're working on site, augmented reality has already been used in a number of our projects where we're actually taking the design model, small chunks of it like plant rooms, and then we're actually putting that into the construction environment. So people who are on site are using augmented reality to see what they have to install in the future, which is proving quite useful. Big data and predictive analytics. What's interesting from the survey is that you guys, um, eight people have done work in data analytics. So again, this is a good indication, and that's not a number I was expecting. I was expecting less people than that. So data analytics and predictive analytics, there's two issues. The first problem is that our industry has got a huge wealth of information and data. But the problem is it's all unstructured. It's in PDF drawings, it's in Excel spreadsheets, it's scattered in Word documents and specifications, it's in emails, it's in WhatsApps. There is huge, huge amounts of information, but it's not structured. So we can't run predictive analy analytics on any of it. So the first challenge we have is to come up with ways of doing data structures and data con constructs, and then we can start running analytics. So I'll show you an example of what we've been doing, but the, the big challenge is the standardization of data. And it's not going to be useful to do it inside one firm. It needs to be an industry-wide program because there's not enough information in one business to get value out of these technologies, but there's a lot of information that's across the industry that is valuable. So again, we'll come back to that towards the end. Um, seven is wireless monitoring and connected equipment, so IoT. Um, cloud and real-time collaboration is, is pretty much a given. Um, and with the current COVID-19, we're getting very, very good at working from home and working digitally and working uh, remotely. And to give you a sense of it, in Malaysia, where I'm sitting right now, we are all at home. So I have not been to my office in 10 days, and I will not be at my office until at least the middle of April and probably the end of April. All of our construction sites are closed except for our tunneling operations, which are still ongoing. But essentially, the whole of our business has been shut down. So we're trying to figure out what we're going to do next. But at the moment, we're working on future projects while we're waiting for the current projects to come back online. So we're getting very good at using cloud and real-time collaboration for those. 3D scanning and photogrammetry is, going to, is becoming more and more popular. And obviously, BIM is number 10 on the list. Now, what's interesting is, in my opinion, while BIM is number 10, it is the foundation for everything else. If you don't have a 3D model, a detailed 3D model, and all the information associated with that model, all of these other technologies are less valuable. They can still be used, but in the absence of a proper coordinated detailed construction 3D model, they have less value. So I think the first one is BIM, and I think everything else is built upon that. But you guys can argue to us. So some examples. Uh, um, Katera is probably the best example of offsite manufacturing. Um, and I use Katera for one simple reason. They do everything. So they do all of the mechanical systems, all the architectural systems, and all the structural systems. And it's a complete factory environment. They're going to go through a horrendous 12 to 18 months in the US because of the current situation in the US. But Katera is one to watch. They're well-funded. They're well-led. They've got a very strong vision. So Katera are definitely one to watch. And the other one to watch are construction robotics. There's a company in the US, they're not developing human, humanoid robots to walk around with laser guns to shoot at the walls. They're using very sensible approaches to build automated gantries. They're building assistive cranes. So these cranes are used to lift up pallets of blocks. They can be used to place heavy blocks one by one. So they're actually basically aiding and abetting the construction workers. And those guys have a very good view of what's going on. So construction robotics, if you want to know what's going on in robotics, is well worth watching. So here is a series of slides which I have basically taken from the Building Construction Authority in Singapore. Um, and this is Singapore's roadmap for what they call Integrated Digital Delivery, or IDD. And being Singaporeans, they have basically their own ideas and they have their own language. So they want to have basically... Um, their own definition. Now, you could argue that IDD is the same thing as IPD, but essentially what they want is they want to build upon their 2010 BIM roadmap and their 2015 VDC roadmap. So they've been at BIM or at the specification of BIM for 10 years, which is great. So what's IDD? So they see IDD as in four different sectors, the design section, the manufacturing section, the assembly section, and the sustainable assets. So basically design, 
offsite manufacturing, construction, and facility management. And what they're talking about is basically collaborative coordinated design using BIM, the integration of BIM into offsite production, the integration of BIM and offsite manufacturing into construction on site, and then using ICT solutions like IoT, and then ultimately actually handing over the asset for operation and maintenance using the digital tools. The big goal with BIM is to create digital assets for digital asset management. So if we look at these one by one, digital design. So these are all examples of how BIM can be used in design. So you can have computational design, you can have intelligent objects for clash analysis. Here's the AR and VR for doing visualization. You can do your quality control checks in BIM. You can do your code uh, compliance checks, and you can even do tender release and handover. And here's the first problem. When these models are built by the architects, they're, they're built for the architect's purpose. They're not built for construction purpose. So when we try and use them in construction for doing quantities, we often find that they're not detailed enough. But they're perfectly okay for demonstrating a design, but they're not buildable. And that's an issue we have to face. Digital fabrication is something that we're familiar with in Komodo. We have a digital manufacturing plan for precast elements. And essentially, it's a digital driven production system. So basically you take 3D models, you use those 3D models to produce shop drawings. Those shop drawings are digitally provided to the machines, which then automatically create and cut and develop steel and formwork, et cetera, et cetera. The robotics are installed to facilitate that. Quality control is done digitally. The storing is done using RFID and the delivery is done using RFID. This is proven technology. The problem is it's completely isolated from industry. So if I go back one slide, if I have a design BIM model and I send that to a digital fabrication facility, when they've stopped laughing at the lack of detail, they then have to sit down and re-detail all of the objects in the design model. So currently it's not technically possible to move from design into fabrication directly. Now the reason is not a technology constraint. The reason is, the people that know how to do the detailing and the shop drawings and the fabrication drawings for this factory are not the same skill sets as the people that do design. So the architects don't know how to design and create models to fit into a fabrication process. Right? So it's very important that people understand that for this to work, this fabrication process has to help and work with the design team to get this to work. Prefab factories in China. How about the prefab factories in China? Uh, Steve, you want to jump on the mic? I don't know anything about prefab factories in China. Yeah, okay. I've visited um, a couple of these factories. Uh, they're part of the uh, five-year plan to produce 14 million um, apartments in China, uh, mostly for social housing. But they use the same sort of technology that you're talking about, but the... Uh, the design and the fabrication are linked together, which is the issue you were uh, uh, raising. Yep. But obviously at the, the current point in time, the design has to be a very standard type of design. Okay, these factories are, are, are used to produce often housing, sometimes hospitals, as yep. we've seen recently. Yep. Um, the level of... Um, uh, if you like, architectural design is, is perhaps limited, but the structural and the, the waterproofing uh, approaches are getting better and better. Yeah. And the, the, what they need is, it's almost like a car production line. Um, and I do have uh, some slides which I'll show the students in another class okay. uh, where, where that actually, uh, you can see those things going on. So that was just my point. Yeah, so I think, but I think the, the main point there is that the designers are closely related to the factory. I can imagine in China they're solving that issue by having the designers sitting in the same office as the manufacturers and they're, do, and they're doing the detailing from there. Well, I think it's based around the, fa the idea, one, of standardization and yeah. two, the fact that there is a market of uh, 14 million units in five years. So there is an economy of scale. Oh, yeah. The road. But, the, but the Malaysian government wanted to build a million units as well. So we've got to figure it out. Okay, anyway, that's just thought I'd raise that point. No, that's good. Okay, so um, we're way behind schedule. So digital construction is um, when you get to site. And again, you can use it for manpower tracking, equipment tracking, you can use it for installation. So we've already seen an example from Ken about using AI for safety, which is great. Um, field BIM is basically using um, setting out information and then all the site data monitoring and submissions. So we've got a whole bunch of stuff going on. 
the challenge with this is figuring out how, how much this information to share with the design team and how much to use for asset information. And this is the big, big problem. There is an expectation from clients that they're going to collect lots and lots of information from construction projects, and they're going to use that information to run their facilities. And the PDF that I share with you has got clauses in it requiring asset information management to be collected. The problem is they don't know what information they need. They don't know what format the information is going to be in. They don't know what systems they're going to use to run the facilities. And in the absence of those things, it's very hard for designers and contractors to actually supply usable information to the owner for them to do asset information management. So the biggest challenge in our industry when it comes to BIM and asset information is getting the facility managers or the asset managers or the ultimate building operators to actually be very clear, very early in the project, how they're gonna run the facility. And I'll be honest, in most buildings, in certainly that I've been around, if water starts leaking out of a ceiling, if a sprinkler goes off, if a pump starts wor stops working, when you call the facility manager, he's more than likely gonna turn up with a bucket, a wrench, probably a few screwdrivers, possibly a hammer, definitely a torch, and he might have an iPhone in his, or a, a smartphone in his pocket but he's not going to have an asset information database linked to a 3D model. So the, the facility management industry is still far behind when it comes to digital adoption. So, so this aspiration of digital asset management is still aspirational. Um, so Steve's made a comment that the, uh, the, there are standards being developed for and protocols for this. Yep. So the standards and protocols have been developed. If you look at past 1192, there's some very good UK standards for asset information and asset information delivery. The problem is, until the facility managers tell us what they want, it's very difficult to deliver. So these are the, the um, strategies. So what the Singapore government have identified is a number of things that have to happen in order for us to be able to achieve IDD. And these are similar to the survey I've just done with you on Google. So developing and promoting collaborative platforms. So a common data environment would be one. Uh, I'm working from the bottom up. Identifying and encouraging adoption of uh, specialized software, which is not so important. Collaborative procurement approaches. Uh, nurturing research and investment and piloting new solutions. Widening the adoption through public and private sector clients, which is crucial. And strengthening capabilities and enterprise development. So these are all government speak for how we're going to develop the industry. But here's, here are the challenges. So, so on the design side, so the first challenge with the design are that the agencies for regulation, so this is Buildings Department in Hong Kong, this is BCA in Singapore, they're still using BIM, uh, they're are still using BIM processing um, capacity capabilities, are lacking them, um, and the design model is not developed to tender stage. So what we're seeing is the architects are not doing enough detailing and enough design work. That's one issue. When it comes to manufacturing fabrication, the design and construction BIM are not linked to manufacturing, which we already explained. And while there are opportunities for automation use of robotics, those opportunities are um, limited unless we can standardize these building projects. When you look at the uh, site situation, BIM is not used during construction beyond 3D. This is changing. So what we're seeing is contractors are becoming more and more data centric. And they're starting to realize there's a lot more value in BIM than just the, the actual models. The documentation is still very paper-based. That is very, very true. So anybody who's been in a construction site in the last 10 years, you will be astonished how much papers are still used. Um, it's changing slowly, but there's still too much paper on site. There's not enough people relying on digital systems. And when it comes to asset information management, the building owners are still learning how to link BIM to FM. That's an understatement. They, they're not learning, they just haven't got a clue. Um, and there's a lack of capability infrastructure to support FM operations digitally. That is down to costing and the way FM operations are procured. So most FM operations are low cost bid. So everybody who bids low cost, they're not gonna spend money on infrastructure. They're not gonna buy iPads for mechanics. They're not gonna buy uh, ex extensive internet connectivity networks for the guys to operate on. So these are the issues. Right. So before I go into the case study, does anybody have any questions on IDD from Singapore? <laughs> 